Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Phil at the Movies. I'm your host, Phil Walsh, and this is episode number 105 of this ongoing podcast series that is always with a love of movies. As promised, this is the first episode that will launch our YouTube channel. Uh, but today, I'm I'm not alone, as you can see uh, or you will hear in a moment. I'm pleased to welcome back friend of the show and friend in general, Chris Evans from Gathering of the Geeks. Chris, welcome back to the show. Hey, always happy to hang out with you. Oh, always a pleasure to have you. And I believe this is your sixth appearance mm -hmm. on the show. I, it's either sixth or seventh. I, I, I had a list that it got erased when i did a uh, a clean on my phone and so uh i i it's I, either six or seven so huzzah you know your uh you know plaques and uh, you know green jacket will be coming in the mail so you can you know, be all official and what <laughs> i kind of feel like you know how steve martin is hosted center live the most times yeah i kind of feel like i'm chasing his record you know that's not a bad record to chase i i must say so you know we keep it going you know we'll you'll be in that category soon enough but uh, I'm sure we got some stuff later this year. I was going to say, this is only the beginning, but uh, you know, as of you know, this episode, you of course are the inaugural guest for the, uh, the YouTube portion. And we've, we've entered the visual age, so to speak. I, I know big, big deal here. Um, so uh, as promised folks, uh, this is going to be the uh, additional way that you can uh, listen to this show. If you don't want to hear my voice, you can watch these kind of discussions. And that's really why, I'm doing it because we can have it's a lot more fun and engaging when you can actually see, you know, two people talking as opposed to just necessarily listening to the sound of of my voice go on and on. So, uh, you know, Chris, welcome, welcome, and thank you definitely for for being a part of it uh, here today. Now, uh, today is a special episode. Now, I know I said that about a lot of the shows, but today is a ranking episode. We haven't done haven't done one of these in a while, and I am. Really excited because we're ranking the filmography of Christopher Nolan, now Academy Award winning director Christopher Nolan, and soon to be, based on the headlines that came out today, Sir Christopher Nolan. And uh, isn't that cool? Uh, how fitting, like how fitting that in short order he will be knighted. I mean, that just, if that isn't cinema in and of itself, I don't know what is. Lovely, lovely cinema. It really, it, bingo! That 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 gift always comes in and comes into play in some in some form or another. So, we're off to a good start here tonight. Um, so just just to kind of lay down the the ground rules, everybody. Not that there really are rules here, but um, we're we're going to go in reverse order, uh, ranking all the way to our number one film. And and I'm guessing there may be some overlap here, um, but I have not shared my list. Uh, with Chris, he hasn't shared his list uh, with me, so this will be truly spontaneous and and you know here in the moment. So you know there may even be some shuffling around of of the list, but uh, it, it definitely took me some time to try and hone this down to something that I felt was both complete and fair. And well, I mean, I, I really can't be objective when I'm talking about Christopher Nolan, so there there is that. I mean, like we were saying off air, it's it's hard to judge or not to judge, but to rank his films because they're all like a certain level of quality. Mm -hmm. It's not like he has a bad film. He has ones we like less, of course. Yeah, but but you no, know, there there isn't a film that where it's like no, this is this is terrible. It's there's mm -hmm. there isn't a bad one in his in his lot. Which, I mean. Well, films in you gotta you gotta give it to the guy at this point. And that's some acclaim if you think about it, because I don't think any director has, you know, a filmography like that. I would say Quentin Tarantino's is close. Yeah, but even he has some stuff that I don't really want to watch again. Well, that's the thing. You also look at the cultural and and sort of mass appeal of his movies, and even though they're sort of made for sort of mass audiences they still feel both personal and mm -hmm. extremely well made like th there's never a moment where no one you know cuts corners or phones it in so to speak like every movie like he he's shooting for a 10 every single time he yeah i think it's the way he does it like if you think about it, every movie of his has a character that you you're invested in yeah and that's the way i think most of them should be because if you don't have that central character that you care about, the movie doesn't work as well. And he pushes that, and like even in the Batman films, 
he made Bruce Wayne the star, and you don't even question. It's like, okay, cool. I don't care if he's in the suit. No, I mean, that's, again, that's the power of Christopher Nolan. Mm-hmm. I mean, when he can get you to invest in Bruce Wayne for, I mean, you know, just, you know, take Batman Begins for like an hour and five minutes. I mean, that's, that's, that's damn impressive. <laughs> it really is. And, and even like his ensemble cast, like you look at Inception, everybody gets a moment in that and they all work flawlessly together. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, beautiful, beautiful cinema. There you go. <laughs> and drop. That's right. That's right. That's um, right. So that that is the the agenda for today, everybody. Uh, of course, you know, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, begin. Uh, if you could rate and review this podcast, and now if you can like and subscribe, uh, that would be also helpful. And of course, share it with your family, your friends, anybody who you think might enjoy listening to a movie buff go on perhaps too long at points uh, over over his love of, of movies and cinema. But, you know, I enjoy what I enjoy. And that's, that's the whole point of this show. And certainly I appreciate everyone for tuning in each and every week. And, uh, you know, now in this case, following over to YouTube again, it feels like hey, we've entered the digital age. Oh my God, what's going on now, but, uh, going to try to keep it lively and entertaining with this new, uh, component to the show. And again, just going to try to keep growing it and, and rolling along again, as I've said, I will keep, keep talking about movies so long as there are movies. And fortunately that doesn't appear to be, uh, stopping anytime soon. So here's to the movies and many more to come, but, on that, uh, Chris, anything uh, else you'd like to to add before we uh, begin today's uh, topic? I don't know how reliable my list is, but I'm going to do my best. That's okay. That's all good. Yeah, like I said, this is all meant to be subjective here, folks. Mm-hmm. This is this is, th- These are our opinions. It's not meant to be definitive. So put down your virtual pitchforks if one movie happens to be higher or lower than the other. Again, this is coming from two people who really appreciate and 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 value Nolan's work as a filmmaker. So it's it's all from a place of love here. Uh, and, and we're just we're here to talk about uh, truly an impeccable record which uh you know, i'm feverishly awaiting whatever he plans to do next which you know manifesting a horror film but we'll, we'll save that for later i'm with you <laughs> yeah there we go all right so now i guess with uh without any further ado we'll uh we'll use the words from the joker and here we go so uh chris if you'd like to start it off what is your uh I don't even want to say bottom of the list because it's not even fair to to use those words. But what comes in in uh, at number number twelve? Or I, I think you have them uh, with eleven. So yeah, I haven't seen the follow. I will get to it, but I haven't seen that one. That's um, all good. So my eleventh, which it's not a bad thing. It just I like it less than the others. Uh, my number eleventh is actually Memento, which. I think is a staple among Nolan fans, and it, it, it in a way. It's probably the movie that got him the most attention to do what he's doing now. Mm -hmm. But it's I've seen it once or twice. It doesn't really resonate with me. And I I think the performances are there. His direction is there. The the way he handles time is there. But something about it just doesn't click with me the way the other things do. It's still Mm -hmm. a good movie. It's just not my favorite. Someone else memento. Totally fair. And I'm actually going to co-sign that because coming in at number 12 for me (laughs) is Memento. And again, I know that's going to be blasphemy in some circles Mm -hmm. uh, because this movie is held up. And I I agree with everything you said. It's not a it's not a bad film. But to me, it is one of those films where once you know the, the twist and I mean, it's not like it's sort of, you know, hidden like the twist comes out at the very end uh, with what's going on, but it took me a few rewatches to sort of see all the pieces fit in kind of into place. But once you've sort of put that puzzle together, it's kind of like Jack is out of the box Mm -hmm. and the effect isn't quite as there. And I sort of have the same issue with, with mystery films sometimes where like, once you know what the, the, you know, who did it or who the killer is or whatnot, it kind of lessens the effect. And I think, you know, not that, you know, rewatchability is everything, but this is one where it's almost like, okay, I, I've seen it and, you know, I, I don't need to revisit it uh, 
again, you know, I'm sure I will at some point, but it's not a, it's not of top of mind. Uh, but like you said, it's, it's, it's Nolan at his Nolanist. I mean, it's, it's all right there. Time, a, you know, a conflicted protagonist. It's all right there, but yeah. uh yeah. yeah that's right uh but yeah it, it it is the movie that started him on his path and you know i'm again i'm you know i'm glad the film certainly exists because it it sort of got his foot in the door and and you know paved the way for what he was to come but you can see where he was you know sort of trying out different ideas and and harnessing his skills uh you know for for what would ultimately follow in, in subsequent films but yeah no we're, we're we're in agreement there which um I had a funny feeling that there would be some overlap, particularly when it came to this film. So uh... I, I think there's going to be a little bit more as we go on, but, <laughs> but there is something I, so I've heard there's a version of Memento you can watch from the, like it's flipped around. The end is the beginning. So you watch it in a linear style and I would like to watch it that way. So would I just to see how it plays out. Cause I think it would feel like a different film. I think it would too. Cause the mystery of course is gone. So you're just watching it more as, this is the story kind of thing. Right. And I wonder if that would work better for me. But also that seems like out of character for Nolan in a way. Because there's always a catch in his movie. So if you do without the catch, are we really watching a Nolan film? I guess? That's the thing. It, it's sort of, I feel like you're cheating in a lot of ways if you were to it, watch it straightforward. Right. It, it's You're cheating on your essay here. <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't want that. No, so maybe we... just watch it as intended, but still, if it's out there. I'm curious. I, I if if it was put in front of me, I think I would watch it mm -hmm. just just for the sake of clarity's sake. You know, see mm -hmm. to see. An, I mean, I love extended versions or alternate cuts of movies, so that would be right up my alley. It'd be fascinating, I think, just to yeah. see how it would play out differently and how the reaction would be. Even though you know the story, seeing it from that angle might change. Yeah, no. It, again, it might have a different. You know, it, it might find itself higher on the list next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I. It, who knows? Who knows, right? But uh, again, it's it is the film that got him started, and he wasn't even nominated for an Academy Award. So, you know, it all it all goes back to Memento. You know, like it or not, that is the movie that started it. And you know, you can you can see the the wheels turning uh, in, in Nolan's mind, which you know you, you got to love it when things kind of follow through uh, from point to point. But uh, all right, let's uh, let's move on to our our next uh, spot on the list. Chris, what do, what do you have? I think this one might surprise people. Oh, uh, it's not it's not as surprising as Memento maybe, but Insomnia. Okay. This is a film I do like a lot. Okay. But I also feel like it is I don't want to put it this way, but I know another way to say it. It's very generic. There's mm. nothing artistically special about it. It's just a very straightforward thriller. Mm. It has some great performances. We get to see Nolan work with some amazing actors. I mean, Robin Williams and Al Pacino in the same movie. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a winning combination that you didn't think you'd even see. Like, they don't go together normally. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Insomnia is the next one for me. I like it. Don't love it. It's good. No, that's fair. Um, for me, coming in at number 11 is actually Nolan's first film. And this is the following. And it is the epitome of a low budget movie, but it doesn't feel that way. I mean, this was apparently shot on weekends over the course of a couple of years. And the plot of it, I mean, it's, again, you talk about going back to the beginning. Nolan stuff is all right there. You've got, again, a conflicted protagonist who just likes to follow people. That's his his sort of passion and one day he ends up following somebody and turns out that this guy is a criminal and through circumstance our our protagonist gets caught up in this web of deception and crime and robbery and it's it's really a high stakes film even though it only runs like about an hour in in like five minutes but i was glued to it from the moment it it started right to the end. And, and again, there's the classic Nolan tropes of time manipulation and uh, the unexpected twist at the last minute. But I, I have to say, I was really impressed by this film because sometimes a director's first attempt at filmmaking is not always their strongest moment. Um, you know, 
we can certainly cite a number of of early you know student films or whatnot uh, from any number of directors. But it's clear watching this film, Nolan had something there, and it's only just been perfected. Uh, in the decades that have followed. Plus, there's also a cool Batman Easter egg in the movie, which I mean, you know, just talk about a a, a harbinger of things to 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 come uh, in the best possible way. Uh, it was cool to see the bat emblem show up during uh, one of the scenes. It was like plastered on somebody's front door. It's like, oh, that's kind of a cool little moment. Like, you know, who would think just, you know, five or six years later what no one would be doing. But again, everything has to tie back to Batman here in some way or the yes. other. You know, if you can't talk about Batman, you know, what can you do, right? Not much. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So that is that is my uh my number eleven, the following, which I, I seriously recommend everyone check this out, especially if you are a fan of of Nolan. I'm not even sure it has a a an availability on on DVD. You probably can find it somewhere, but I, you know, caught it actually, you know, God forbid on, on streaming of all places, but uh, this is one time where streaming came, you know, came in handy, but uh, definitely check it out if you are a fan of his work and even just a fan of just student films or, or, or kind of, you know, filmmakers first movies in general, because it, it really is kind of a, an interesting look into the past and, you know, you kind of see the roadmap of where things are going. I think it'd be cool just to check out as a, maybe a completionist. Yeah. Because I think most people have seen his filmography, but maybe not that one. Yeah, th this is one. Whenever I I have a discussion with someone, you know, they've seen every film but this one. Uh, and I and yeah, definitely, you know, if you are a completionist, I would say give give it a watch because it does. I mean, one, you know, you complete the whole package, but then it's it, it's just sort of cool to see the the seeds of whatnot uh, of. And, you know Nolan's uh, cinematic genius here, where things were going, uh, because I mean it it really is all there. You know you can follow the the trail, so to speak. The journey. There we go. That's right. All right, Chris, what's next for you? So I actually switched it while we were talking. Oh <laughs> boy, here we go. I knew this was going to happen. I couldn't because I was thinking. I was like, you know, I don't watch this one as often. Okay. So I'm going with Inception. Oh, all right. All I right. think Inception is a a great film mm -hmm. there's so much cool stuff in it it is stuffed to the gills with content and there's things in this movie i don't think have been topped as far as visual effects go like when the the room is turning oh yeah that is just iconic and it always will be and it, it's just so cool and you know no one i think is underrated for his work with ensemble casts mm -hmm. i think most people like we were discussing earlier most people think oh he's just a character guy he is but at the same time, he really works these ensemble casts to perfection, I would say. And this mm -hmm. is one of those cases that really showcases that. Mm -hmm. Because everybody does get their moment. Everybody gets a good moment. And it never lose fo loses focus of the main character. And it also ends on such an ambiguous note. People still talk about this thing. I love that ending. I just I have to too. say. It's cool. I like when you have these ambiguous endings that it's not a downer, but it's a dis it's a talking point, you know. Yeah, you, you don't argue about it. You just, hey, well, what do you think it was? And that's no, it's, fun. And no, exactly. Like, I love it when movies can unite because so much of what is is released today, there's always like you feel like you have to get into one camp or mm -hmm. or the other. And I mean, you know, I'm sure I'll probably you know curse myself with this, but like <laughs> you know, it it feels like for the most part. Nolan's films are unifying, mm -hmm. at least among you know, people who enjoy this stuff. And it, 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 like I said, it's it's fun to have that back and forth. Like, what does it mean? You know, is it a dream? Is it not yeah. a dream? You know, the thing stopped moving. It didn't stop. Fast yes, enough. that's right. And, and it also it's a it's a blockbuster. That's the thing about it too. It's a huge blockbuster film, but there's so much heart in it. It doesn't feel like a blockbuster. And also, like, I'm a huge Bond guy. I get to see a glimpse of what his James Bond would look like. So that that puts me over the moon, too. Yeah. No, it, it, it's, it really is the best of, of both worlds. And when you figure it came out after The Dark Knight, so, mm -hmm. like, you know, Nolan pretty much had a ticket to do anything after The Dark Knight. And the fact that he made this film, and not only was it you know, well-received, critically but you know again this was this was a blockbuster you said it right there uh, i think just sort of again underscores nolan's ability to just sort of 
tap into what people want to see or maybe don't even realize what they want to see. Like on paper, this movie probably shouldn't work. Like it's about a guy that goes into people's subconscious and steals dreams. I mean, I shouldn't say that because it, it is a unique concept, but I think if in the wrong hands, you could have a mess on your uh, on your hands. You know, it, it's one of those things where if you go too far in one direction, it's like almost yeah, like a, a it, bingo. There we go. Yeah, I think you need a careful hand. Is yeah, how I would put it, because it, it is it, it's a very unique story mm -hmm. that could, it could have went either way. I'm glad it went this way, but I also think you know you go two more notches to the left, you're in just full on action territory. Two more notches to the left, it's just a boring character. Or to the right. You're just in some kind of boring character movie. Yeah. So it, it's like in a perfect spot. Yeah. No, I, that's a perfect way to sum it up. Perfect way to sum it up. Uh, so for, for my number 10, I have insomnia. And and like like what you said, it's, it is really a fine film. I mean, in, in some aspects, it, it might be underrated because, I mean, You've got Pacino, you've got Robin Williams, you've got Hilary Swank. Like, I mean, it's an incredible cast. And this was only Nolan's second film after Memento. And it, it's it's kind of an interesting concept. It's fascinating that it was a remake. So this is like one of Nolan's, well, actually, it is his only sort of, you know, non-original, you know, film, unless, you know, obviously you count Batman and whatnot. But I mean, he didn't write the script on this one so it, it's not it doesn't necessarily have his trademark style and i think you said it best it, it does have almost a generic um by the numbers yeah it, it is paying by the numbers like you kind of know where it's going but uh I, to me the the pacino williams uh dynamic is so fascinating in the film uh i mean i always loved when robin williams would would play against type and, mm -hmm. and he does that brilliantly in this film and it kind of you know makes me wish that you could have had future collaborations between the two of them because there was such a unique uh dynamic going on in that film uh it's it's really unsettling and, and creepy but uh yeah it's it's a it's a serviceable film again doesn't reinvent the wheel um you know i guess if, if nolan has a safe film this is probably it uh, by any by any stretch of the imagination but I mean even then like it yeah th there are still those elements that they're much more hindered I mean we're not dealing with with time manipulation or whatnot in this film but you know again we've got that that classic uh you know conflicted or or you know sort of damaged uh protagonist in uh in, in Pacino so you know the the elements still uh, still come full circle here I'd actually like to see him and I know this is a, it's not gonna happen I would like to see him remake this film as his own. Mm. Like now that he he's he's Oscar award winning Sir Christopher Nolan, right. <laughs> I'd like to see him go back and do Insomnia his way, and how that would work. <laughs> oh, I think it would be it would be a masterful. Would be, I, yeah. I'd be curious. I mean, we, of course, we can have Robin Williams back, no. unfortunately, to just recast the whole thing. Yeah, but I'm yeah. sure he could find some great replacements. Yeah, no, that's actually yeah. I would be fascinated to see what Nolan would do today, uh, maybe because it, it's in the Pacino role. <laughs> there we go. Yep, yep, perfect. You know, and maybe Christian Bale and and, and Robin Williams. Oh, I like that. I know. Yes, even reverse from I like that. Yeah, I yeah, see. <laughs> switch it up. Switch it yeah, up. That works for me. Yeah. No. Uh, I. Yeah. That would be. That would be a fascinating what if. All right, Chris. What is your What is your next film? The next one is The Dark Knight Rises. Oh, okay. Um. So out of the three Batman films, clearly this is my least my least favorite. <laughs> there is more about it I don't like than I do, but the stuff I like, I really like. Um, like Catwoman, I think is fantastic. I really like Bane. Um, I mean, Bale as Bruce is always good. I don't even I don't even know I need to mention that on this one, but <laughs> Bale is always good. Um, just the, the film. There's things about it I don't like. Like the eight-year gap has never sat well with me. Uh, I know earlier I made the comment that you could watch this movie and not care about Batman. Uh, this one I actually do care that there's not a lot of Batman because of the way it's set up. Mm -hmm. 
it's not set up like the way it begins is or the dark knight is this is this is a different beast and it feels like it to me this feels more like an afterthought of nolan like oh i guess i gotta do the third one so let's do this but it still has some great stuff in there like i said the cast some of the moments like we actually see the breaking of the bat which mm. is a huge deal i remember sitting in the theater thinking they're not really gonna do this they're not gonna break back they did it you know and that was that was a great moment um one of my favorite scenes actually it's early on with Anne Hathaway Selena Kyle in a bar and she goes from kind of this oh, yeah. uh, confident um I don't know snarky lady to just screaming in terror and pretending to be innocent <laughs> and it is just amazing the way she pulls that off it's a credit to Anne Hathaway's talent though she is one of the best actresses working today in my opinion but uh, it, it just doesn't hit the mark completely for me and it's probably some of his joseph gordon levitt entirely can't stand it in this movie that's that's a fair that's a fair point uh i have i have more to say on the dark knight rises but i will i will save that for later <laughs> okay. later in the list but it's um, higher on yours then. Okay. It, it, it does it does fall a, a little higher but uh we'll uh we'll get to that when we get to okay. it um yeah so my my next film uh this will be number nine for me is dunkirk and I mean, I would say this is probably the greatest war movie after Saving Private Ryan. Now, I'm sure I'm going to get some flack for saying that, but uh, I am not usually a, a fan of quote unquote war films. Mm -hmm. uh, I just they're not my my cup of tea usually like Saving Private Ryan. But before Dunkirk, that was pretty much it. And then after Dunkirk, like, OK. I, I now have another war film that I can be invested in and, and can kind of put on that same uh, pedestal, if you will, with, with saving Private Ryan. And again, I know that this is going to be blasphemy in some quarters, but uh, no, I this film, I love it that Nolan took a, a real life event, but fictionalized it with this core group of soldiers. It's, it's harrowing. It's immersive. Again, all of the Nolan tropes are, are in there, but just from like a visual standpoint, like I remember watching this in theater and just being in awe of the images on the screen. Like, again, I go back to the Saving Private Ryan reference. Like it's of that quality and, and, and cinematic greatness and just like portraying destruction and the hells of war in a way that is both realistic but also has that cinematic relevance to it uh i i, I just think it's a it, it's a i don't want to say it's an underappreciated no one film because it, it certainly has garnered its praise and it was nominated for a number of academy awards but i i feel like this is the one film that maybe you don't always hear people talk about enough and, and i'm just here to say it, it's it's like top shelf quality uh you know, Nolan work here. And like I said, easily the best war film, in my opinion, since Saving Private Ryan. Uh, no question. But uh, yeah, that would be be Dunkirk for number nine for me. So Chris, what is, uh, what's next for you? Technically, this is overlap because your nine and my eight are, if you take out following this. Right, yeah, nine. yep. So they're, the, so they're the same overlap here. Oh, uh, we're gonna be blasphemous together on this. <laughs> I'm gonna co-sign with you. I also don't like war films. They are not my thing. I don't really enjoy them. Now here's where it gets blasphemous. I have not watched Saving Private Ryan because oh I don't like these kinds of films. <laughs> I, I think the closest to a war film I've watched and enjoyed is Forrest Gump, if we even count that. <laughs> um so th there we go. Uh bring on the blasphemy, I guess. <laughs> Um, but Dunkirk, I broke my one rule for Dunkirk. <laughs> That's a Dark Knight reference. Um, <laughs> I love Dunkirk. That is my, I, I think it is a fantastic film. And it's one I, I really regret not seeing in theaters. Oh, okay. And I didn't see it in theaters because I figured, okay, it's a war film. I know it's Nolan, but it's a war film. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think it was sometime last year. Um, it came up in conversation. I was like, well, that's an old film I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. I think it was in, in, in anticipation for Oppenheimer. 
Mm, makes sense. I, I should probably see this, complete the list. Yep. And so I watched it and I was in awe. I think it's also the shortest Nolan movie, if I'm correct. Yeah, it, it is. I don't know the runtime offhand, but no, it, it is a quicker film. I, I think it's like right at two hours, which is even shorter than Begins. Yeah. I, I'm not counting the following, just like his. No, his. Yeah, films. no, that's right. I, I believe it's the shortest. And I was enamored with this movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, the story is great. And it, the interesting thing is, yes, it's a real life event. But in a way you don't, well, I didn't, I didn't connect it with the real life version of this event. You know, I was kind of taking it as I'm being shown because it was different enough from this point of view yeah. or these points of view, I should say. No, that, that's actually a great, a great way to put it because yeah, it, it does sort of take you to almost a ground level uh, approach to it um you know some people might even say like a street level view and in a lot of ways there's an intimacy with this film that you don't always get with some of Nolan's films like I I mean when 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 shit is blowing up I mean you you feel it right there you feel like you're not at 300 feet you feel like okay I'm I'm right here you know on the beaches on the sand you know with these guys it also has the heart the most is so like when mm. um Barry Keoghan's character's in it. Yeah. Uh, his story is so tragic in this movie. I did not expect that. It's one of his most emotional films without yeah, and question. The way Killian Murphy's character reacts to everything. Yeah. Like, I have nothing but good things to say about Dunkirk. It would be higher on the list, but there's just things on there I I can't. <laughs> no, there's <laughs> there's other films, so no. Yeah, yeah. but Dunkirk is is I love Dunkirk. No, I, I'm I'm with you 100. Uh, yeah, absolutely. No, that's right. You know, set, 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 you could, Chris. I'll you know send your comments and notes uh, my way. Leave, leave Chris out of this one. I'll, uh, I haven't even seen the other ones. So. I'll say they. <laughs> you'll be. You're fine. You will absolve you. The there we go. <laughs> um. All right. So this uh this is mine number eight, and um. I I have a feeling that. We will not be in sync with this one, but we'll, we'll probably not. see what happens. <laughs> uh, my number eight is The Prestige. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, you know, this is one of those films, I think, of all of, of Nolan's movies, with the exception of, of Memento, uh, which we mentioned earlier. I think this is the one that I have, have revisited the least amount of times. And it's not because I think it's a, a bad film at all. It, it's just one of those movies... I haven't, I just, you know, it, you, you watch it, then you sort of put it on the shelf for a couple of years. But every time I do a rewatch it, I am reminded of just what a beautiful film it is. And only Christopher Nolan could take a story about rival magicians and put some spark into it and make it this exciting, almost heist movie. I mean, there's really a, a, a thriller feel to it that despite the subject matter works really well and of course you've got Christian Bale and and Hugh Jackman which is just a wonderful pairing in this particular film and it's actually one of my favorite Christian Bale uh, performances I think he's just you, you can take your eyes off of him in this film he just I know he just I mean he does it with every character where he slips into it but in this one like I, I don't see Christian Bale uh, which is again hats off to him as an actor but um i don't know this this film it, it's it, it's it's magic come to life i guess is probably the best way i can describe it but it's again it's always got that that nolan um that nolan charm and i imagine this film would probably be further on the list closer to the top if there weren't for the other seven mm-hmm. films that you know, that i'm going to be talking about but uh no i i Every time I rewatch it, I, I'm reminded why it is such a great film. And, you know, much like in the same way with Dunkirk, I, I think this is another underappreciated Nolan film. I think probably because it came out post Begins and pre Dark Knight, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. But I mean, it's it's one to check out, definitely. I mean, again, just from the cast alone, I mean, Jackman, Christian Bale, Scarlett Johansson, I mean, it's a stellar ensemble. And again, it's it's a fun, unique concept. Only Christopher Nolan could make, you know, a movie basically about competing rival magicians. 
you know, heart racing and, and exciting to watch from beginning to end. So that's a, even, yeah, go ahead. I was there was even that copycat film, sort of. The Illusionist, do you remember that one? With oh, everyone? that's right. That's yeah. right. It didn't work as well. Bingo, bingo. There's something, again, it's it's an indescribable, you know, magic power that Christopher Nolan mm-hmm. has, where he just can take these these concepts, which, you know, in some cases, you know, you read it on paper, you think, okay, well, this movie either is going to be, you know, a, a hit, it probably will be a miss, but he's able to just inject it with a, with a, I don't know, a sense of life and movie magic, if you will, that it, it takes a, you know, maybe a boring concept and, and really gives it that kick to it. Something about it. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's a unique, it's a unique film. And I, I would definitely, I, I know I would have it further on the list, but there's just seven more films that are just <laughs> More, more near and dear to my heart, but I will leave you all in suspense as we get further and further to it, or closer and closer to it, I should say. Hmm. Uh, but, but Chris, what is what is next for you on the list? The next one for me is Interstellar. Oh, okay. I really enjoy Interstellar quite a bit. I actually like it so much. I watched it back to back nights one time. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I was really impressed by this film. I think that it's one of Nolan's most out there movies by far probably because as much as i enjoy it i still don't even understand the end and i've seen this movie multiple times i don't get it like i get it up until a point um and and you have this so many like beautiful scenes in it like the actual bookshelf scene once you understand it or Uh, once they show it to you again at the end it's it's so wonderfully done and it sticks with you i think it's kind of the exclamation point on the movie because we see that at the start in true Nolan fashion, it is in front of us the whole time. And this is also with some heartbreaking performance. Like Matthew McConaughey, I don't know. Like, I, I think it was one of his best roles, in my opinion. Of all the things he's done, this is like top tier for him. It's so good. Absolutely co sign everything you said there especially mcconaughey's performance because it is i I mean it's it's a master class and i mean you know i could go off on a tangent about films and roles that weren't nominated i mean this was certainly nominated but just talking about from an acting standpoint i mean it is it's like what it's definitely one of his best roles and and i could probably even make an argument that it is his best performance Mm -hmm. um but in one of Christopher Nolan's films, I mean, this is this is like some top level, you know, top drawer stuff here. This is yeah. this is a, a a phenomenal performance. He gave everything he had in this role, and it shows. Yeah, it I mean, fantastic. The GIF is always on, <laughs> and I mean, you, you, you know, everyone knows you know wh- which one we're talking about, and it's sort of you know it's kind of become a joke now because it's it's been overused, but I mean that scene where he is watching the videos i mean you'd have to be made of stone not to feel something Mm -hmm. with that because it is so powerful that with the score and just it's oh it's it's beautiful and and sad to watch at the same time yeah and if you see the meme you don't know the context yeah you really need to get the context (laughs) of that scene bingo really do bingo i want to say it might even be one of the best scenes in nolan's filmography I would be I would I would I would I would hear that. So it, it it's just really, really good stuff. And you also have some interesting things like young Timothy Chalamet's in it. Yeah. Which I didn't even realize that was him until years later. It's like, oh, that's the kid. Okay, I know that guy. <laughs> you know, you got that, you got some other stuff in it. And you know, the visuals for what this film is are pretty cool. Because it's been in the news lately, uh w- you know, with Anne Hathaway and mm-hmm how this movie was really kind of a, I want to say a saving grace, but I mean, Christopher Nolan sort of wrote the role and, and, and gave it to her. Um, and, and she speaks so highly and, and, and clearly loves it. It's one of, if not her best performances, I, I believe she yeah, is, she is riveting in mm-hmm. this film and there's that scene between her and McConaughey where they're just talking. Again, it's not a, a spectacular visual scene. I mean, you know, there's some good camera work, but it's it's 
two people talking and it's so raw it's so poignant and it you know it kind of speaks to you know the the story that's in all of us and and she just i mean she just sells it without even trying like it, it's just one of those it's an effortless performance but yet you you sort of sit there and say how the hell did she do that and again it's kind of even the same way with mcconaughey but yeah i i love what ann hathaway does in this film absolutely yeah it's a solid performance absolutely stellar interesting and well very good fun there very good fun. uh all right so that uh, i will actually i'll have more to say uh in just a bit but um uh, that brings me to number seven and for me it is inception this film i re-watched recently and it is such a mind-bending wonderful escapade i mean again on paper, this is one of those films where it could go either way if in the wrong hands. I mean, like I said, you go too far, you're in Nightmare on Elm Street territory. And, you know, again, thank God for Christopher Nolan because, you know, we wouldn't want that. Um, you know, those who, you know, who like Freddy, I'm sorry, but this is, you're not going to be getting a lot of love from Nightmare on Elm Street, at least for me on this show. I don't want to speak for you, Chris, but... um yeah, we'll leave it at that. Um, no, th this film, it's one of, I think, Nolan's best ensembles. Like, everybody in this film plays their part perfectly. And yes, DiCaprio is, is the lead, and it's one of my favorite performances by him. But everyone has a part to play and does it so well and, and gets their moment, whether it's it's Hardy or or even Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Michael Caine, of course, uh, pops up. Marion Cotillard is devastating in this mm -hmm. film. Uh, it's such, oh, it's it's such an unnerving performance. And I, I remember, I had sort of forgotten until I had rewatched it recently. I, I mean, she's like downright diabolical <laughs> in, in this film. Like it, it really... It's such an unsettling performance. And again, her and DiCaprio just play so well off of each other. But I, I don't, this is one of those films where it's it's such a wonderful experience to watch visually. But like you said, there's a, a story here and you get invested in it, you get caught up in it. And we're still debating the ending all these years later. I mean, I think even Christopher Nolan has finally, you know, put out a statement regarding it. But like, I, I, I think he, I don't know if he's quite, he has quite answered it himself, but I believe he has said that uh, his, his wife, Emma Thomas views it as uh, Cobb doesn't care by the end of the film. He, he, he That's mm -hmm. the whole point. He's just, he's happy where he is. He's back with his kids. Nothing else matters. So whether this is reality or, or not, uh, it's he's indifferent but i mean even then like that still doesn't calm the fires and i think even no one has said like you see whatever you want to see Choose in this adventure. yeah and, and i kind of like that about this film because like you know when i rewatched it i was like no th this is definitely reality but then like you know i know i've had the same you know the different thought times before like no maybe this is a dream like it, it's one of those movies it plays with you uh in, in such a way where you cannot ever really decide it's like the top it just keeps spinning no, it's a fun film absolutely love this film and uh you know th this is one film if you have a chance to see it in theaters because i know they are uh re-releasing a number of of christopher nolan's films mm -hmm. over the next couple of months go see this film because it is wild to see on on the big screen and again that scene where the floors and the walls fold in on each other and even like when the train comes down the 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 city street like that's just so amazing to see on the big screen it's, it's why i love going to the movies it's it's for films like this i mean again you can you know, certainly have a great time watching it at home but there's just something about watching this film on the big screen that it uh it, it's hard to it's hard to replicate that yeah triple or bust yeah <laughs> All right, Chris, what is the next film for you? Tenet. I happen to really, really enjoy Tenet. I know it's incredibly confusing. And even if you've seen it 10 times, the ending still will throw you most likely. <laughs> I choose just to think it's the simplest explanation possible, and I roll with it. <laughs> um, 
but I, I just really, really enjoy this one. I think the action is cool. The story is fun, which I don't think that's really a common theme in Nolan films. Fun. This one is though to me. Um, it, it's cool. Like Kenneth Branagh is a villain. Like that writes itself. You know, really does. It, it's just a good time. Uh, I, I love Robert Pattinson and seeing him here in mm. this James Bond like role. Nolan has a type. <laughs> and seeing him in this James Bond type kind of role is just awesome to me. I really like John David Washington. Mm. I know some people do not like him at all in anything. I'm kind of a fan, and it's probably because of this movie. I would love to see them work together again. I would too. I, I hope they do at some point. Yeah, because no, he 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 really sells the film. He does. He does a great job. Because like Robin Pants just kind of cuts in and out. Yeah. He's the star of the film. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I never watched it. No. So I, I like that a lot. Um, the opening, I think, is just a thing of beauty. <laughs> mm -hmm. I saw that part in. Um, so I, most of a lot of Nolan's films have those prologues in IMAX. You can see before the movie comes out. I remember seeing that, and before seeing that, like Tenet wasn't really on my radar. I was going to see it because it was Nolan, but I was like, yeah, I'll just see it when I get to it. But after seeing that, I was like, I have to get to this movie. <laughs> And as soon as it was available for me to watch, I did. And I just really, really enjoyed it. I can't say anything negative about it even. I also like how in a lot of his movies, once you know the ending, you can see the seeds of the ending throughout the film. Like mm -hmm. little things make more sense. It, it, as much sense as it can make into the movie. It's the ultimate vibe movie. <laughs> it's something. It is. I, I, will, I will hold my thoughts because... We haven't reached it yet in my list, but um, that's okay. Uh, no, I, like I said, I mean, and I credit my most recent rewatch of it, which oh. was actually the first time seeing it in theaters. So that that definitely has helped, you know, probably shift it one way or the other. But uh, more on Tenet in just a little bit. Um, number six for me, and I was actually surprised where this film ended up because I actually thought it would be a little bit higher it's batman begins mm -hmm. and you talk about a film that had to do a lot of heavy lifting this movie restarted the batman franchise i mean batman was i mean batman's always been popular but when it came to batman at the movies i mean it was never a surefire thing prior to this movie i mean god love batman and robin but they they laid an egg with that movie and you know christopher nolan came in with a bold and devilish reimagining and this is the first reboot of a of a movie franchise kind of the, what started that whole mm -hmm. craze where you know franchises were getting reinvented time and time again i would argue this is probably the best reboot because it gets back to the core tenants if you will that make the character work and relatable and it's also just a great origin story it's it's i think the best comic book superhero origin story on film bar none and i say that as someone that loves uh the first spider-man movie this film i think does it better it certainly takes the seeds of those movies by not having the you know having bruce wayne in the costume for the first hour but you're so invested in bruce it's like oh okay he's finally gonna put the costume on like that's that was a brilliant move uh by nolan and company and i mean just the cast of the film from bale to killian murphy to liam neeson for god's sake i mean it's just a it's a it's a stacked cast it takes the material seriously it still remembers to have fun it is a comic book movie after all but i mean you know you, you think about taking a risk it's i would say it was probably one of the riskiest films that that no one has made because you know batman is not what what he is today like back then batman was kind of a joke batman had the you know the nipples on the bat suit and stuff like that like it was you know tonight a freeze is coming you know there's my arnold schwarzenegger impersonation but you know like it, there was no guarantee that batman begins would have been a, a success and not that it was this you know, uber uber a financial juggernaut i mean certainly compared to the dark knight and the dark knight rises but it did respectable a number you know numbers enough that it obviously greenlit a sequel and you know frankly saved the batman movie franchise and and, and i would even argue probably saved the comic book movie genre i mean it, or it 
it reinvented it in a way where people could now you know, enjoy these films, but but enjoy them on a level that was sort of reserved for more prestige or uh, you know high concept dramas than than what you might find in a you know quote unquote comic book superhero movie. Uh, so I again I give this film a lot of credit and it's it, it, it's just a lot of fun. And it's you sort of think like you said before like you don't always think of like when you use the word fun to apply to a Christopher Nolan movie, but th this movie is a lot of fun. I rewatched it recently and just like there's just little moments in the movie like you know whether it's like the chase with the bat uh, with the tumbler uh, with the with the cop cars or even just like you know Alfred's witty one liners like it's just I, there's just a lot of great moments in this film you know bruce wayne saying you know you know damn good television like it's I know, it's just i know I, I always have a big smile on my face with this movie and, and certainly the ending of the movie helps tie it all together because you know what's to come and obviously now with the context of history uh you know we can see it all together but uh it, it's a great film and and you know certainly helped make christopher nolan uh the household name that he would he would ultimately become <laughs> Sir Christopher Nolan. Sir, that's right. It all started somewhere. Uh, I yes. My thoughts on that one. <laughs> that's why I, I figured you would. Uh, Chris, what is next for you on the list? So next for me is The Prestige. Oh, uh, okay. I actually co-signed a lot of stuff you said earlier. Um, I would just add maybe that one of my favorite things about this film is, yes, I, I think it is one of those you don't watch consistently. Because as much as I enjoy it, I haven't even watched it that consistently over time but I do consider it to be a masterpiece. But one of the cool things about it is the ending is so fitting and the way it works out, when you rewatch the film knowing the ending, you can put the pieces in, the, in their places and it still makes sense, which is kind of a key to these mystery type films. Because a lot of times we see, you know, we go through the whole movie trying to, well, what's going on? Who did it or whatever? When you get that twist, like, oh, okay, that's cool. But when you watch it back, it doesn't fit. It's like trying to put a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't fit. <laughs> Whereas in this case, it all falls into place according to plan. Mm. You know, you know, then you can pick out, oh, that's why she says, sometimes, some days I know you mean it, some days I know you don't, because it's not the same brother. <laughs> You know, and, and there's other little touches, too, throughout this film that work. And I think even on the first time I watched it, I never suspected Bale was both characters. No. And it is right there in front of you the whole time, much like the stupid trick he spends, that Hugh Jackman's character spends his life trying to, to figure out. It was all there in front of your face. And I love that about this film. Because even if you pay attention, you probably won't get it until it's told to you. <laughs> and it, it's it's such, there's so many, like you mentioned the performances are great, but I think Hugh Jackman gets swept under the rug for this one because he mm. plays against type here. Hugh Jackman rarely plays an unlikable guy. Mm. I mean, even his Wolverine is incredibly likable. And I, I think in Prisoners, he's not as likable maybe, but even then, you kind of you, you can sympathize. You understand, yeah. Yeah, you understand where this is coming from. Whereas in this, he's just a jerk. Yeah, he's an obsessive jerk, and, and it's it's just interesting to see him that way. And um, Michael Caine is like the balance between them is a stroke of genius. I I miss Michael Caine appearing. In Nolan films, uh, I mean, I miss him appearing in films in ge in general. I mean, certainly he's earned, you know, his retirement, you know, and, and, and enjoy his time. But yeah, it, he is a great connective uh, block, if you will, in this film. And it's a nice balance between Bale and Jackman. It is. And something I just, you know, I rewatched it before this because I, I had it on my list. And I'm like, I need to rewatch that. So I, I did it before the show. And uh, something I noticed toward the end, <laughs> Michael Caine gives Bale's character a certain nod, very reminiscent of what we see in Rises. They they basically go off to live their lives and it, they nod at each other, and it's like, hey, I've seen. Them. I felt like Leonardo DiCaprio uh, meme, you know, for months that, in Hollywood. That's right. That's what I felt like. I've yeah. seen that. Um, so that's yeah, right. I, 
Yeah, Prestige is pretty high on my list. And also, Rebecca Hall is in this. Oh, that's which, right. Um, she just kind of skates by because everybody's busy talking about Bale, Jackman, Kane, Strong Johansson. But she's mm-hmm. in it too, and she does pretty well. No, it's it's again another another stacked cast, mm-hmm. uh, which I mean, you know, again, you you even look at at Memento you know, and sort of tie it back to that, which is certainly a, the smallest, I think, or one of the smallest. Probably the following would be the the smallest uh, ensemble. But even then, like everybody is is, is on the same level, kind mm-hmm. of a thing. No, nobody is phoning it in, and it's just always interesting to see how you get all this talent essentially in the same room, so to speak, and everybody has the part to play. Even Andy Serkis, for having such a small role, is so memorable in this movie. And yeah. David Bowie's Teslik, I mean, that, that's good times. That's that's iconic right there. Mm-hmm. That is, I that again, it, it, just for that performance alone, I'm telling you, watch the movie, people. Watch mm-hmm. the movie. If you have not seen it. I think, did we spoil the twist? I think we did. But it's it's also a twenty year old movie. Yeah, I, I mean, at this point, like you know, it's shame on you. I guess if you haven't seen <laughs> haven't it's seen the movie. Old, yeah, I know. I'll I'll put a tag at the beginning. But yeah, no, at this point, like, come on, folks, get get with the program. <laughs> watch no. the movies. Watch, please, you know, please go watch the movies for for the love of movies, for God's yeah. sake. <laughs> <laughs> for the love of movies. Uh, yeah, no, I gonna co-sign again. Just it, it it's a it's a marvelous film, absolutely mm-hmm. marvelous film. Um. Okay, so yeah, my uh, now we're getting the the real, real meat and potatoes, the real, the real, uh, the real top shelf, if you will. Uh, these are my top five. So this this is where we're talking very near and dear to my heart. So number five for me is Tenet. I mm-hmm. I adore this film. Mm-hmm. Absolutely adore this film. And I never had a chance to see it in theaters when it released because of of COVID and whatnot. So my first experience seeing this film was at home. And I have to say, this is a movie, if you were going to watch any Christopher Nolan movie, this is the one you probably should race to the theater and go see, because it is one of those films that just plays out so much better on the big screen instead of, at home and you know you can have the best setup in the world nothing beats the theatrical experience just from the opening alone which is probably i would say that's one of my favorite openings to any of his films it is it is adrenaline rushing it is exciting you you don't even know what is going on but you're just following the movement you're following the action and you know, it goes from like zero to a hundred in the blink of an eye, and then it slows down a little bit. It takes its time, and I always say to people again, don't overthink this movie because I think sometimes people are are looking for something that's not there. Mm-hmm. Yes, it, it is big, it is bold, it is complex, but it's not that complex. I mean, I think even Christopher Nolan has said like, j- like just watch the movie. Don't like try to be thinking ten steps ahead. This is not mm-hmm. three dimensional chess in a way just enjoy the movie for what it is. I mean, and frankly, it's probably the closest we're ever going to get to a James Bond movie by Christopher Nolan. Like, like if Nolan did Bond, this is, I think the direction it would go, mm-hmm. which I mean, frankly, I'd be all fine with that, you know, sign me up for more of those, but I don't, it, it's just such a cool movie. Like, I mean, that was my, my immediate takeaway when watching it again, it's just such a cool movie from the visual standpoint to the characters to the cinematography to just its existence again it's just one of those movies i i I don't know i know some people have very strong feelings about it Mm -hmm. positive and negative uh but i don't know i just connect with this movie i vibe with this movie in the best possible way and i am delighted to see that more people are discovering this film and you know, because it, it sort of has been the you know the butt of jokes for a number of years, yeah, um, yeah. but it does feel like people are coming around to it a little bit. You know, maybe not loving the film, but at least appreciating for what Nolan is going for. And I mean, like again, you want to sort of narrow you know narrow it down to what it is. It's a time travel movie, basically. Mm-hmm. Like it's it, it's not that complicated, folks. You know, it's it's got spies. 
it's got espionage, it's got time travel, like, just enjoy the ride. I think that's part of the problem with it for people. Mm. Um, now, of course, you and I were on the same level with this. Yeah. But I think a lot of people, and I don't mean this in a negative way at all, I think they are trying to find some greater meaning in it, or like, oh, there's something deeper here. Right. I, I don't really think there is. I mm-hmm. think you just watch it, take it at face value. There's two timelines. They are colliding at the end. And I think that's just the best way to explain it. It still makes the ending confusing. I agree. But it's still like, it's just they're colliding at the end. That's all. So you're seeing the beginning of one, the end of one. Worlds collide. There you go. So I, I don't know. I, I'm glad people are embracing it now, too, though. Even if they're not loving it, as long as they're watching and giving it a chance, I think that's what matters. Just give it a chance. It, it, exactly. And, you know, you who knows? You may end up enjoying it. You, you may be part of the, uh, you know, the tenant cult. One of us. One <laughs> exactly. Of us. So I mean, you can always will welcome converts uh, when it comes to this film. I, I, I would love a sequel to this film. I know it will yes. never happen, but I would just love to see what happens next. I would love to see more of of the protagonist and and Neil's friendship explored. I I, I feel like there is like five movies in and of itself that you could do with this. Uh, you could make a whole franchise based off of this one movie. I would love to see a sequel by a different director who handles Neil's part of the story. Ooh. So like, let's say, I know I've been using this name a lot, Denny Villeneuve. I'm very high on him right now. So yes. I think if you if you had like him doing the Neil part of the story as oh. a sequel, I think that could be fun. And then bring Nolan back for like what would be the third movie. Oh. To kind of just round everything out and do a whole new story. Yeah, no, you're 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 talking where I live, brother, right <laughs> there. That oh boy, I I like stuff. That sign me tell me where to sign that's start manifesting that into existence mm-hmm. right now my god that would be fantastic uh no it's i mean it's it is such a a wonderful exciting film and i mean again I mean, that's the power of chris Nolan. we're still talking about it now four years after it was uh was released and you know some people still don't understand it or that they, they want to understand mm-hmm. it and i think you're exactly right just don't overthink it. it. It it really isn't that complicated, and I'm not trying to be flip when I say that. It, I think people are looking for something more there, there, and just watch the film. Just enjoy the film. Or try to. It, or try, try. That's all I ask. Just try. Just try. You don't like it? That's fine. That no. Again, I I, I won't. You know, think negative negatively of you, or just mm-hmm. you know, we'll do so in private. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, yeah, tenant. God, I I I that I could do a whole episode on that which i will probably have to do at some point and i'll have you back on chris and we can just geek out about tenet and just talk about how how wonderful it is all right (laughs) you clear space on the calendar um (laughs) all right chris what is next for you on the list so these are my top three since i didn't have the 12 yeah this is my top three these three are very important to me we're going to start this list off and i've been fighting with this one because three and two or interchangeable, mm-hmm. but we're going to put it at three anyway, just because I'm biased. Um, <laughs> Oppenheimer. Now, when Oppenheimer was announced, I think I had the same reaction everybody did. So Nolan wants to make a movie about the atomic bomb. Okay. <laughs> and leading up to the release, I was like, okay, I'm going to see it. Like I am with everyone. It's Nolan. And just like every other time I see a trailer, I'm in love. So the you know the trailer blew me away. I was like, okay, yeah, this I gotta run again to another Nolan movie. And I did. And when I watch this movie and I think of the runtime, it's I think three hours and some change, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. I don't even care. You could tell me this movie is an hour and a half and I would believe you. <laughs> because the way it moves along is a master class in cinematic storytelling. I'm using big words now. (laughs) It is such a wonderful cinematic journey about this horrible thing that you don't even really grasp, I think, what's actually happening until the character, I say character, but until Oppenheimer himself does. Mm -hmm. And once you, it, it just turns the whole thing because you're grieving with Oppenheimer in that scene. Like everybody talks about the bomb. Yeah, the bomb was cool. Nolan built a gigantic bomb. That's awesome. But 
the scene that takes place afterward where everybody's cheering and Oppenheimer's having the panic attack in the stands, that is cinema, if you will. <laughs> I adore that scene. I adore everything about this movie. It, it is flawless to me. If I were to say, like, if I were to pick a movie from Nolan's filmography to show anybody, it's actually this one. Mm. I think because it is the most well-rounded of his films, it has so much in it. There's so many moving parts in this thing. And not one of them feel underdeveloped. Not one of them. And this also has the largest cast he's ever worked with, I think. Yeah. And, like, everybody has, I, I know we've been saying this, but everybody has a role to play here. From the smallest to, hey, I know that guy from 10 years ago in a guest spot of something. That guy still does well. Like, Jason Clark is in this movie, who I think is one of the most um, underrated actors, actually. Oh, definitely. And and his role in this is really such an antagonist. Mm. And you hate him, but at the same time, you should probably hate Oppenheimer. <laughs> I mean, okay. We should all be hating Oppenheimer, but you kind of don't. And that's the magic of this film. It puts him in a light to where, like, maybe he wasn't the devil. I don't know. <laughs> I will have more to say on 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 Oppie in in a bit, but I I will just start by saying, cosine everything that you have said. Absolutely, I, love Oppie and I could also go on about it way too much. Sometimes. No, it, <laughs> literally, we could do a whole podcast just on each individual character and Oppie and her, and you know, have a great time with it. Mm -hmm. uh, love just, you some Oppie. Yeah. <laughs> Amen to that. All right, so I, I will I will give you number four uh, for me, and uh, yeah, th this is one film. It, it at one point I think it might have been further back on the list, but uh, it, it has aged like a like a fine wine or uh, whatever the nice uh, liqueur is that Alfred is drinking at the uh, end of the film. And if you know if no, you if you're if you're following along, you 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 probably can guess what I'm gonna say uh the dark knight rises is is number four uh for me this film as i said it has aged very well in the now what is it, 11 years uh or no, what 12 years since it was uh released i i think it is a master class in superhero films in comic book movies in just damn good storytelling it is a bold film. You know, you think of a movie like The Dark Knight Rises, it it makes a decision. It mm -hmm. ends the story of Bruce Wayne as Batman. I can't see any other comic book film having the uh the cojones, if you will, <laughs> to 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 do that. I I it is such a decision. And you know, again, it's it's a moment where you kind of get your cake and have it too uh where you could read as oh you know does batman die does he sacrifice himself or you know does he you know get, you know get his happy uh, happy ever after well it's it's both you know it's it's both and that is you know again finding you know finding the happy middle but it's so much more than that yes is it a is it a flawless film no, there are some issues with it, and and certainly, you know, I would I will co-sign you know, some of your points that you mentioned earlier because it it is not a perfect film, but for what it's what it strives to accomplish, I I think it does, it does stick the landing, and it's actually my favorite Christian Bale Batman performance. Mm -hmm. I think he, I mean, he's great in every film, but there's just something about this film the journey that we take with him and and we see most of it is Bruce Wayne because he doesn't spend much time in the Batman suit but it's almost one of those things you, you don't care in a way because you're so invested in his character and his his struggle but I, I think Christian Bale just does something with this film he he really found his voice if you will with 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 Batman in this movie and I don't know it, it's an I mean, epic is is such an overused word but it really does feel fitting to describe this film uh again it had the impossible task of trying to follow the dark knight it was never going to be the dark knight but it it goes in, in a different way and actually tells a more personal and human side of the batman story and i, I think like i said the, what i love most about it is the definitive nature of it and that's something so rare 
in you know the world of endless comic book films to have a conclusion and and to sort of have it all tie together with the two other films uh, just chef's kiss absolutely well done uh, you know even if even if no one's heart wasn't in it he it's he he still even on his you know his worst day if you will he still manages to uh, to to get up and deliver something that is a uh, worthy of his talents and hey we're still talking about this film people still talk about it to this day uh love so that love that's what it is you know uh but uh i i i adore this film and it like i said it really has aged well for me especially uh in in the years following because when it was released i was i wasn't down on the film but it was it was i don't want to say it wasn't what i was expecting but you know, sort of like when you put it next to the dark night, it's like putting a, a light bulb next to the sun. It's mm-hmm. never going to be that bright. But I think, you know, time heals everything. And and I mean, now I, I it's a fine class, a case of a, of comic book superhero movies. Time heals everything. That would mean that Batman and Robin is better than we thought. By that logic, yes. No, you're you are right about that. I, I probably should do a revisit of that film at some point. You can do that. I'm gonna revisit Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> there we go. All right, all right. We'll, I'll we'll revisit Dark Knight we'll, Rises. We'll swap, we'll 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 compare notes afterwards. Yes, I think that'll be fun. All right, all right. Sounds good. I'll put that on the agenda. <laughs> all right, Chris, what is next for you? Number two is the Dark Knight. This movie, I think revolutionized comic book films in a way because i'll get to the i mean it's obvious what number one is for me but (laughs) i'll get to that in a minute um (laughs) this one showed that yeah it's a comic book movie but it could be a different genre we hadn't seen this before every comic book movie up until this point was just clearly oh that's a comic book movie big villain harebrained plot world's gonna end gotta stop it (laughs) or something of that nature Whereas this was, this really is a crime thriller. If you take Batman out of the suit and you put him in like a Dick Tracy outfit, just an overcoat and a hat, you get the same result essentially, I think. And that speaks volumes for this movie. And it's just a damn good movie. (laughs) The storytelling is impeccable. The cast is stellar. I mean, you can have a whole episode or a tangent about Heath Ledger's Joker. There is not enough praise in the world for this version, I think. He, and, and the funny thing is for me, I can't stand the look of him. I do not like the way Heath Ledger's Joker looks, but when he's in motion and doing his thing, I don't care. <laughs> you know, he is the Joker when he's doing all that stuff. So that is, for me, I think for me, that's a huge thing how particular I am about stuff like that and and he's just a fantastic and you have Bale I think this is his best performance because I feel like there's he has the most to do in this one um you know you have a lot of emotion from him and it is just a really really good take on Bruce I think I I love the stuff like him falling asleep at Wayne Enterprises (laughs) the thing with the ballerinas is hilarious to me I I love the scene uh, you know, at the restaurant, I bought the, I own the restaurant, put two tables together. I love that. Uh, I just love him as Bruce. And I think there's a great showcase of his Bruce. It's always begins, but this one's a little different because he's more fully formed. I think the action is great in this one. Um, and the ending, again, people talk about this ending. Did the Joker win? I'm of the, I'm of the mindset the Joker did win technically. So, and, and also, you know, things the Joker says comes to pass in Dark Knight Rises. Mm. The chips were down. They tried to eat themselves. The Joker was right. And, and I mean, the hospital scene. And I'm also a, a sucker for Harvey Dent. Harvey ah. Dent is my probably my second favorite villain. That's not a pun. He really is my second favorite <laughs> Batman villain. And to see him get treated with such respect and mm. care and a performance by such a great actor as Aaron Eckhart. I mean, this movie, I said this when it came out after this movie if there were no other batman films after this if they said no more we're done no more i would have been fine because this movie gave me everything i needed in a single film so that's my number two well i'll have more to say in in a moment but i (laughs) i love i love what you said there brother love it love it love it 
All right, number three for me is Interstellar. Hmm. I mean, Christopher Nolan always cites Stanley Kubrick as one of his great inspirations, and certainly there is a lot of of two thousand one A Space Odyssey influence on on this film. I would actually make the the argument it goes beyond two thousand one. Like th- this is this is so much deeper. This is so much more introspective. Yes, it's about space exploration. Yes, there's a lot of great visuals in this film. Arguably some of the best visuals in any of Nolan's film. I mean, just the shots in this movie, they're like moving paintings in a lot of ways. But for me, what sells this film are the performances and the story. And strip away all of the science space exploration it's about a dad wanting to get back Mm. for his daughter it's about that simple but but solid promise that he makes and even though again spoiler alert if you haven't seen the film you know he finally does return and and meets her when she's much older than years and he's still the same age he was basically when they when they left earth it is one of the most heart-wrenching and and poignant scenes not just in a christopher nolan film but in any film like i always have to laugh when people say oh christopher nolan is such a a cold and detached filmmaker my counter to that is go watch interstellar because you will be in tears or at the very least moved by the end of this film and i don't know just that moment between father and daughter even though they're separated by at this point, years and, and lifetimes, essentially, it is it is still so grounded. And, and the conversation, even though she's much older, it, it's like where they left off. It, it's it's a dad talking to his his daughter. And I, I just I just love the sincerity that is in this film, not to mention it is a visual masterpiece and, and arguably one of nolan's most visual films and certainly is one that again i've said this about a couple of them this is another one that you you should see if you can in theaters because it is it is such an experience you really do feel like you're going to the stars and back when you watch this film uh absolutely absolutely love it it's poignant when it needs to be but it's still uh, and it's somber when it needs to be too but it also strikes that that optimistic note and I mean, what a great story about about hope and and possibility. Uh, absolutely love this film, and it 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 certainly earns its place in my ranking as, as a top three uh, Nolan film. Just Chef's Kiss, absolutely love it. <laughs> there, <laughs> there we go. Uh, all right, Chris, uh, let's uh, let's hear your uh, your number your number one. The number one is Batman Begins. Ah. This is a movie that I adore on every single level. I, as Of course, I'm a huge Batman fan. Everybody knows that. And this is one of those times that a movie hits all the right notes for me. Uh, the anticipation for this movie was immense for me. And it nailed every expectation I had. And Bale embodies the character perfectly, in my opinion, in, in all three roles, in all three movies. But you know, this is the first time we had him, and it, it, he was just perfect. He still is to me. He is my Batman, and I think everything about this movie, like you were saying earlier, it just works. Mm-hmm. And it's also kind of wacky in a way. It's not <laughs> as realistic as the other takes that Nolan did with him, or in Nolan's other films. This is the one where he kind of went off and let Batman um, sort of be Batman. Because you do have a giant microwave at the end, essentially warming up all the water in Gotham and making it come, you know, come up through the sewer and whatnot. So it, it's an interesting um, idea to have in a Batman film uh, from no one. I mean. And I think it just gets so much right when it comes to the character. Like he really nailed the essence of the character. And the look of Gotham was really unique and cool, like the narrows and and all that it was cool and i like the twist because you gotta have a twist it's no one with <laughs> the card and race that was nice mm. um and you know i actually feel like angley's hulk was instrumental 
in a lot of ways for comic book films because oh yeah in that film mm. you had I, I i'm pretty sure it was already oscar winning at that point because he won for crouching tiger so you had an oscar winning director come to a superhero movie and try to make it something more mm. well hulk didn't work for everybody but it's like nolan saw the homework and said hey i can do that but i'm gonna make it work and did he <laughs> and, and you know start to finish it's just a fantastic film anchored by real performances even katie holmes who is not my favorite <laughs> honestly she's not but i think it's also a case of she's just out of her league she's surrounded by these higher caliber actors i mean even if you don't count bale morgan freeman michael Caine, liam neeson you know it's kind gary of gary oldman to, gary oldman yes gary oldman it's hard to play in that sandbox when you're with those people you know it, it just it's hard so she did her best she's fine um also i love the bat suit that helps and that <laughs> ending i actually had the ending spoiled for me before the movie oh um, yeah it is it's it fine but <laughs> it still hits every time i watch that movie like I, I, even though i know the dark knight exists i've seen it that ending still hits a certain way and it's just fantastic i've also watched this movie a disgusting amount of times I I love this movie every frame of it. No no shame in rewatching a favorite movie more than <laughs> more than the allotted time yes. I could I could co-sign that my friend. Uh, no I, I Begins is a special film. Mm -hmm. Absolutely special film and uh again it it started it all. It started it all for that trilogy and and I, I just, I'll re -co I'll re-sign everything that you said because it, it is, uh, it is a masterclass. All right, so this brings me to my, uh, my top two. And anyone who has listened to the show, anyone who knows me, will not be surprised by either of these choices. <laughs> but uh, you know, can't have, can't have, can't have all the, uh, all the, you know, surprises and whatnot. Uh, it should be some predictability in life. Uh, so number two for for me is and. I will just start out start by saying I think of all of his films, this is probably his crowning achievement. And there's obvious reasons for that. It's Oppenheimer. This this is if there was ever a film for Christopher Nolan to win an Oscar to to get all of his flowers, so to speak, it is for this film. It is arguably one of his boldest films, but it's also a conventional film in the sense and i don't mean that in a negative way it is it's a historical event it's with historical figures it has the nolan flair if you will there is some cross-cutting and uh you know, playing around with the timeline but it's done in a way that it can appeal to the mass audience and Again, only Christopher Nolan could take a film about J. Robert Oppenheimer and the creation of the atomic bomb and turn it into a, a blockbuster. I mean, not that box office results are everything, but the film made nearly a billion dollars. That doesn't happen by accident. And I think you said it well. It is a masterclass in filmmaking across the board from production design to the cinematography, to the score, to the way the film is edited. You think of that scene in the boardroom where Oppenheimer is pleading his case before the panel, and you've got that wonderful performance, that terrifying, that aggravating performance by Clark. You are just, you're transfixed by what you're seeing because the music is in, is on point. And the way we're cutting back and forth to this close-up, to the sort of inner workings of what's going on with Oppenheimer's mind and his subconscious, it's it's amazing. Like it, it, this film, I firmly believe, will be celebrated and studied for years to come. And I don't think you can say that about every best picture winner. I, I really don't think that because how many films that take on the top prize can sort of generate that kind of enthusiasm many years later now and again i know i'm biased because i'm a christopher nolan you know fan and, and fanboy but this is a remarkable film and in the wrong hands you could have a pedestrian 
biopic. Mm -hmm. It's not that. This is one part biopic, one part heist movie. It's one part courtroom drama. It, it sort of takes all of the best parts of, of different ways to tell a story and molds it together in this intricate but yet accessible way. And, I mean, like you said, the performances in this film, Robert Downey Jr., Oscar winner. Robert. Oscar winner, Robert Downey Jr. I don't see him in the film. I do not see him in this film. He completely becomes Louis Strauss. It's a, it's an amazing transformation. Florence Pugh mm -hmm. doesn't have a huge role in the film, but she is amazing in every scene she is in. And again, just the, the way these people who we might recognize from other films the way they become these historical figures. I'm thinking of Gary Oldman mm -hmm. becoming Harry Truman. See. Like I remember I was, I was with some people when I saw it the first time and yeah, I kept waiting because I knew Gary Oldman was in the movie and I kept saying, when, when is Gary Oldman going to pop up? I'm curious. And it, it took me for the scene to, to play out before I realized like, Oh shit. That was Gary Oldman. Like, I was so caught up in it. I was like, okay, well, whoever they got to play Harry Truman, he's doing a damn good job. And it's like, oh, my God, that was Gary Oldman. Like, even the smallest roles, and to say nothing of Oscar winner Killian Murphy, I, I mean... Even Einstein. It, oh, dear God, Tom Cotton. He is... That's that's not an actor. That's They, they somehow found a way to bring Albert Einstein in this movie. Like, Magic. It, it is. It, it, it is a movie where... I'm just so glad that it exists because, as I said, it, it, it's not it's a movie that in the wrong hands, I think, could frankly have been a, a bomb and you know, no pun intended when I say that. But Nolan found a way to make it interesting, to make it innovative. And it's I think what I like the most about it. It's a film that presents all of this information, but never takes a definitive side mm -hmm. it really puts it in the lap of the audience and i love it when a film can do that especially when you're dealing with a historical event that we are still dealing with the ramifications with or of to this day i love when a film can put you in the seat because there are moments and i've rewatched this film more than more more times than i can count right now but i am I find myself like, okay, what would I do in this situation? How would I react to this development? What like it you it, it really brings you in to the story. And again, I love it when you can kind of be in on the action, if you will, as an audience and sort of have that moral question, what would I do? And and every time I've watched it, I've come away with a different answer. It's like you said, on the one hand, is Oppenheimer the villain? Well, maybe he, you know, kind of got screwed over here. Like it, it's such a complex and layered film but like i said at the same time it still finds a way to appeal to the largest audience possible uh i, I adore this film it's his crowning achievement and mm -hmm. it, it it's worthy of all the praise that it is has received and i think will continue to receive in the years to come it's just a a flawless masterpiece i think when the conversation comes up about biopics this is always going to be there as one of the best, mm -hmm. especially because it killed. I, I know we've gushed about this movie before, but uh, we love it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> like Killian Murphy's <laughs> performance is unique in a certain way because I feel like in a lot of biopics, you get actors who are doing imitations, if you will. Yeah. Like I'm not going to put down the Elvis movie, but I think when you watch that, Austin Butler is great. He really is, but mm -hmm. is he? imitating elvis or has he become elvis in the film mm. versus like walk, watch walk the line walking phoenix is johnny cash that's a good Whereas comparison like here killian murphy unfortunately is oppenheimer mm. and i i think that's that's kind of um one reason this movie works as well as it does is killian murphy's performance this this really does rest on his shoulders Mm -hmm. Because you know, you, you mentioned that in a, was it maybe a lesser known director or, or not lesser known, but lesser talented, maybe it would not have worked. I also think that about the actor. If you didn't have Killian Murphy, what would this movie have been? 
because you're able to both sympathize and hate this guy at the same time, which is a weird thing. Yeah, it, it, like I said, I, I always find myself so conflicted watching this mm-hmm. film because it's like you said, one moment you're right there with Oppenheimer, you're like, you know, damn it, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're treat this is wrong, you know, but then the same, like, okay, wait a minute, you know, let's look at the bigger picture here. And, this. Yeah, and, and, you know, he's again, trying to have his cake and eat it too, but I, I, I think the ending of the film, and I know I've gushed about this, it, it stays with you. Mm-hmm. And I, again, I'm still haunted by it all these months later it, it's just such a a perfect and yet unsettling way to to end the film mm-hmm. just a uh, again we, we could have a podcast and a half about this film and there still wouldn't be enough time and hours in the day to just gush about it but i will i will try to contain myself because we will be here all night and we don't want that um a commentary of it one day you know what that's actually a good idea i think that'd be fun you know, I've been, I've been, it's actually been on the docket. So hmm. you, you've said it here live. So I, now it, now it has to happen. So <laughs> that'll be coming uh, later this year, everybody. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to watch Oppenheimer, you know, watch it beforehand. So then you can come back and, and listen to me, you know, just gush and gush and talk about this scene and what they did here and whatnot, because I, I probably have, I know too much about this film as it is. And I've seen it more times than I can count, but it's only because I just, adore it and i'm just so glad that it it exists absolutely but that that brings me to my number one and again anybody who knows me knew this film would be at the top of the list and there's a reason for that because it is my favorite film not only of any comic book movie but it is my favorite film period the dark knight there has never been a movie before and frankly since that has match the level of excitement and anticipation that I had for a movie. I had a countdown clock where I was pulling back the little sheets of paper. I made a sticky note calendar and I was pulling down the pages every single day until July 18th, 2008. I was so invested in this movie. I never even entered my mind. Oh, what if the movie's bad? It just, it was never on my my radar the hype was unbelievable for this film i know i've gone on about this before but everyone indulge me just for a moment uh the hype was unreal the the excitement in the theater opening night it's i mean it is unlike anything i have seen before or since there was such an energy to everybody like you knew you were going to see something unique and special but i don't think we were pre- even prepared in all of our wildest dreams for what was about to unfold. And to this day, it, it's the greatest cinematic experience I have ever had. It is a flawless film. It I There are very few films that I will die on a hill for. The Dark Knight is one of those films. If, if you don't like The Dark Knight, of course, that's your opinion, but we will agree to disagree and we'll just part ways on that subject because there is no nit that you can pick, no no comment that you can make that will that will shake my love for this film it is how to make a comic book movie it's how to do drama effectively it's how to work with an ensemble it is a beautiful magnificent film and the fact that it exists in some ways still amazes me because it is such a bold film that you look at even in 2008 the world of 2008 the film took a lot of chances with Mm -hmm. the batman character with the mythology and it doesn't care like it's willing to push that that line and i think sometimes that's what you have to do with any film you have to be willing to take those risks and just hope that the audience will either be there or will follow you through and obviously people followed through with this film because it was a massive hit. It is still celebrated to this day. I have tickets to go see it in about two weeks' time when it's re-released. Uh, so I'm you know, again counting down the days to see it again because it'll be the first time in about 16 years that I've seen it on the big screen, uh, and I'm again can't wait for that moment. But th- this is this is a special film to me. There's no way it wouldn't be my number one film. And again, to to sort of 
pick each moment of, and scene and and dialogue. Well, we'd be here all night, and I don't want to punish you <laughs> with that. But I I will just say there is a scene in this film, and it is I think the reason I love this film more than any other comic book movie, and why it still stays at the top of my list of favorite films 16 years later. There's a moment where Batman interrogates the Joker. It's a famous scene. People certainly do talk about it. But to me, it's unlike anything in a superhero film. It feels like something out of heat. It feels like something out of a crime drama, a thriller. It's just two people talking. And it's it's a battle. It's not a physical one, but it's a battle of ideas. It's a battle of philosophy. It's this... It's the hero and the villain meeting face to face for the first time. It's everything I wanted it to be and more. And despite being a quote unquote comic book film, it actually has real world implications that we have seen, you know, scarily play out in in modern days. So, I mean, the film is is frankly very prescient in in a lot of ways and had its its finger on on the pulse of of society and 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 culture, if you will. But uh, just that that scene, the 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 tension between Bale and Ledger is unlike anything I had seen in a comic book movie before. Haven't seen ever again, as far as I'm concerned. And just from just a pure acting standpoint, it's wonderful to see two pros really bring it all, and and they bring it all in that scene. And you know, I I knew the movie was going to be special. It's a Batman film. I love Batman, but. That moment, I remember watching in the theater saying, I have seen, to use that word again, cinema. I don't think I said cinema at the time. <laughs> that, that, that came later in the lexicon. But I, I, I knew right then and there I had seen something that would have a tremendous impact on me. And it, it still does it to this day. I watch Whenever I watch this film, and again, I've seen this film more times than probably is, you know, uh, you know necessary, but it still has the same impact on me. I still walk away saying that is a damn great film. 10 out of 10, no notes, Christopher Nolan. I stand at the altar <laughs> and worship you. It, it, it's just a marvelous film. Uh, but I, again, I'll, I'll try to restrain myself because I will have more to say about it in a couple of weeks when I revisit it and 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 see it again uh on the big screen but yeah the the, the dark knight the, there was never going to be another film that 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 tops it i mean oppenheimer again as i said i think is his crowning jewel but mm. the dark knight just it has just such a special place in my heart i actually thought oppenheimer was going to be your number one. No, really i i did because i know how much you love it yeah i, I know <laughs> just and a little like, bit like in my own head, I'm thinking, okay, if not for the Batman films, it would be number one for me. And really, it, it kind of is the better film, anyway. Like, re, like you know, it's the better storytelling thing. It's the better movie, but I just love these other two. <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing with with, with the uh, when the Dark Knight exists, I I nothing will ever top it. You know, like. It, I feel like you know Oppenheimer is like I said it's that crowning jewel like mm -hmm. it, it's it, it's a movie's movie in, in a lot of ways and it, yet like if if Oppenheimer can't eclipse the Dark Knight nothing nothing will eclipse it so I I feel I feel that film is lodged right at the number one spot. <laughs> it's, totally, yeah. it's an incredible film. It's hard to yeah. argue that. No, no, like again, I'm, Lord knows I've gone on about it. Yeah, it's, even it's, the ending, like. Th that ending is so special because you don't see that i know like, kind of like empire strikes back sort of ending we've got it like since then we've had it attempted mm -hmm. and i don't know if it's worked as well that kind of ending for a superhero film like I, it works in like infinity war i think oh the yeah one it works there I, I don't know if it's worked in any other capacity but something about the dark knight it, it's just magical i don't know yeah, it yeah. it transcends the genre. It does, and and all the pieces fit. Mm. Like there's no real flaw in the movie. In my opinion, there's no real flaw. I have one nitpick. I've always had the same nitpick. It's not a big deal, and I don't even. It's not. It doesn't even affect the enjoyment of the film. But it, there's just something about The Dark Knight that works incredibly well. No, it's it's beautiful. I mean, again, 16 years later, and we're still talking about it. It's the benchmark in a way. 
Yeah, no, it is. I mean, again, it 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 made Christopher Nolan a household name. It did. It this gave one him, him. Yeah, it. I mean, this movie allowed him to make whatever he wants to make. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's why Oppenheimer exists. Um, you know, it's all everything goes back to the Dark Knight. It, yeah, not because it wasn't just the box office on Dark Knight either. It was the reviews. Yeah, the re- like you had people who don't like these type of movies showing up for the Dark Knight. Exactly. And that was that was the most, um, the most I think amazing thing about it. Because yes, we're fans. We were there either way. But the guy who says I hate comic book films, sorry, was there, yeah. <laughs> and they probably saw it twice before I did. <laughs> And again, I, I I mean it when I say it, like I I have yet to see a film that sort of transcends that level of the comic book movie genre. Mm-hmm. Like it, it is, it is that unique. I mean, it's it was a lightning in the bottle movie that only comes around you know, once, twice, maybe in a generation. You know, and it was released the same year as Iron Man, which is very interesting when you think about it. Yeah, in terms of the context. Yes, so Nolan's film ultimately won that year, but it was cool to have the different flavors, and you had people who had seen both, like, well, I like this one, but I like that one better. But there was no denying the Dark Knight, the staying power of it was immense. Oh, yeah. Like you said, it got Nolan to the next level to where he could do anything else he wanted. Well, got to start somewhere. (laughs) And that's what a start. No, I like that's not a bad film to to have in your uh on your resume. No, oh, I made the Dark Knight. No big deal. <laughs> no, just a just a magnificent film. Um, well, yeah. So there we go. We 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 ranked Christopher Nolan's filmography. Uh, Chris, if you want to just run over your run down your list one more time for everybody. Uh, I'll bring it back up because yeah. I'd be changing in my head already. <laughs> right. um, so twelve, I went with Memento. Just okay. Because yep. I had Insomnia as eleven. I'm, I'm sorry. Memento is 11. eleven. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You would eleven. Ten is Insomnia. Nine would be Inception for me. Eight is The Dark Knight Rises. Then we have Dunkirk, Interstellar, Tenet, The Prestige, Oppenheimer, which I went on about enough, The Dark Knight, and Batman Begins. Wonderful. And uh, my list number twelve is Memento. Number eleven is The Following. Number 10 is Insomnia. Number 9 is Dunkirk. Number 8 is The Prestige. Number 7 is Inception. Number 6 is Batman Begins. Number 5 is Tenet. 4 is The Dark Knight Rises. 3 is Interstellar. 2 is Oppenheimer. And of course, number 1 is The Dark Knight. No surprise there. Um, now, this was uh, this was a lot of fun, Chris. Thank you for uh, coming back on the show and uh, sharing your your rankings of of Christopher Nolan's films, uh, Academy Award winning director exactly. Christopher Nolan. You know, like I said, never going to get tired of saying that. No, it's, it sounds good too. Sounds it does good. that, and Sir Christopher Nolan. I like Sir Christopher Nolan. That makes me think he's going to do a Bond film later on, which I'm not crazy about, but I'll see it. <laughs> yep. At this point, you know, he's already got my ticket. You know, for whatever the next movie yeah. is, I, I'm we're we're there. We're there probably. But I do want night. more. Honestly, I was going to say, like, do you have a a preference? Because certainly he has alluded to the idea he'd love to make a horror film. And you you mentioned that scene in Oppenheimer, which is, I mean, it's frankly a terrifying moment. And, you know, people sort of say, oh, no one doesn't have any experience with horror. Well, no, he has experimented with it in a number of his films. I mean, even just on a, yeah, I was going to say even a smaller level, like with the fear gas with the scarecrow, that's some pretty terrifying stuff i mean the the demon batman is he went intense and nobody asked him to no he just said okay we're gonna go with it that's all right we're gonna go with it like you know i mean even you know the joker who again is you know iconic just in and of himself like he's a creepy guy like so i mean nolan is not a stranger to the you know the the dark and twisted side so but to see him go full horror i i think would be a real treat. I, I I don't know. For some reason, I keep going back to a movie like The Shining, and maybe it's because he has such a reverence for Kubrick. But I feel like it's something on that kind of grand level. I, I'd love to see him tackle. I mean, as much as you know, I think it would be fun. I don't think we're going to see Christopher Nolan make a Halloween film. <laughs> you know, I think that's a take I wouldn't want to see, though. No, no. <laughs> I, don't, I, guess I don't know it, what he'd even do with it, and that scares me. No, I. Um, I there are certain things you just leave well enough alone. I think we get another talking Michael on that one. 
Um, <laughs> oh dear God, know, no! Actually, I would love to see him try horror or western. Oh yeah, I feel like he's done so many different genres at this point. Mm. I would like to see him do horror. Is the is the main thing? I want to see him do a horror movie specifically. And I think even I have floated this idea before. I want to see what he would do with the Exorcist franchise. Yes. Like, even if he were to do a straight remake kind of thing instead of a sequel, mm-hmm. I think that is also in his wheelhouse because he can play it subtle. He can do his thing with it. He can go big. Whatever he wants to do, I think it, it's there for him. Mm-hmm. And I'd just like to see how he handles that. And I imagine it would probably be terrifying. I mean that that one moment in Oppenheimer where you know he, everyone's chanting and then he you know imagines stepping on the corpse. I mean that was yeah. nightmare fuel in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, imagine Nolan with a with a you know fairly big the budget. Yeah, <laughs> it's you know in, in two and a half hours of you know runtime. You know I don't think anybody be sleeping for weeks, but you know we can hope at this point. Um, I would love to see horror. Another angle I would love to see him go would be to tackle a i don't want to say an outright comedy but a more quote-unquote light-hearted film and and the okay. example i would use is something like american graffiti i would like to see him sort of take more you know a, a, you know kind of a, a a light drama if you will and see what he could do with that again not something you would always expect from him because his films are much more uh, heavy duty in a way. So I think it'd be interesting to see him kind of really step out, uh, you know, and kind of play against type and, you know, not that you, you know, you'd want to see it necessarily, but you know, he is a fan of Talladega, uh, Talladega nights. So, you know, he does have saying, that is, you know, I was actually, since you say American graffiti, I was thinking something like the hangover. Oh, yeah, that's another good point. I, yeah. I think that could yeah. be in his wheelhouse. I mean, he can do anything clearly, but as far as what I would want to see, if it's a comedy, I think something along the tone of the hangover would work for me. That's a good that's a good point. But then yeah. at the same time, if he wants to do like a Ricky Bobby sequel, I'm all in for that too. Like I said, he has carte blanche to pretty much do whatever he, he wants at this point. Fast and Furious movies. That's right. So well, maybe he's the one to do the Fast and Furious Jurassic Park crossover. I, you know, at this point, the sky is the limit. You know, he has his Oscar now. So uh, Christian Bale versus Vin Diesel and like two cars. That sounds fun. Again, my this ticket is, is already it's already <laughs> <laughs> it's all about family there <laughs> no like i said my, my ticket's already bought opening night for whatever he's gonna do so you know whether it's that or you know he says he's a fan of la la land so you know he wants to do a musical go right ahead. i'm good with that too I like he said, whatever he wants to do at this point he has he has free reign in, in my few directors i'll pretty much follow anywhere <laughs> it, yeah no i mean that I, I can't i will do that no me. that there's no and like some people, I feel like okay, stick in your lane. Mm-hmm. He can go all over the freeway, kind of thing. Yeah, he's like perfect. the car and tenant, backwards, sideways. You know, he can do whatever he wants. Invert time, go right ahead. It's just colliding. It's just That's colliding, right, guys. Just colliding. That's it. Amen to that, uh, Chris. Before we get out of here, where can people find you? Uh, social media handles, etc. You guys can follow me on Twitter at that Chris seven zero. You can also follow the podcast I do with my buddy Emmett Davis over at G of the geeks. And I would love it if you would follow this show too, because Phil was awesome. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Chris. And again, always great to have you back uh, on the show and all the social media handles and whatnot will be in the show notes. And uh, I will just uh, drop a plug as well. If you haven't had your fill of me here, uh, but you want to, hear more about Batman and and all things DC, I would encourage you to follow uh, the show that Chris and I both co-host with our buddy Anthony Caruso, DC Unlimited. We'll be dropping a new episode, probably in short order. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've already got one out now talking about the Batman Part 2 delay and all other rumors and developments for DC projects. Again, Chris and Anthony are in my opinion, the, the the certified experts on that show. I, I really do defer to them. And if if anything, just follow and like that show to support to support them because they're two fine uh fine gentlemen and I had the privilege of working with them and, and calling them friends. So give DC Unlimited uh a like and a follow uh you know just for them alone. But uh Chris wanna thank you as always for coming back on the show and today talking about 
I know my favorite filmmaker and I know one of yours mm -hmm. as well. So uh, definitely we'll uh, get you back on. Got to keep bumping up the, those appearances. So you can get the Steve Martin number. We'll, we'll get, the, we'll have to Google it. We'll find, well, next time you come on, we'll, we'll have his number and, and then we'll be, you know, be sure to just keep, keep increasing. Like I said, we got a lot of films to talk about this year, so there's more to come, but that does it for me today. Everybody I want to thank you as always for, uh, tuning in and hearing our rankings of Christopher Nolan's films. That is all for to now. Uh, for now, I'll be back next week, and we will certainly do this all over again for the love of movies.